Okay, so today's topics, I'm going to be covering uh, the ancient astronauts having to do with the Sumerian connection. Uh, Sumer basically is uh, where we mod where we would call today's modern day Iraq. Now, Sumer has been mentioned throughout history as Mesopotamia, Babylon, the cradle of civilization, but the first culture that we have record of, literally, in the history of, of <clears throat> as we understand it now, points 6,000 years ago to ancient Iraq's Sumer. So tonight we're just going to go through some of the artifacts and things that point out that there was a time when man actually lived amongst his living gods. Just like the Bible says there were giants upon the earth, the Sumerians very specifically speak of a time when they lived amongst these beings. And it's not just a translated English version of the story, it's coming from the source. Okay, so a couple of things just to uh, dive into the topic of, you know, where do we come from? That's kind of a, a thing that modern science has been trying to answer through either a Darwinistic uh, perspective or through evolution. Uh, was, it, was it God creating the earth in seven days or have we been naturally evolving from something ever so simplistic to something more complex? One of the theories that has recently made uh, light in the scientific realms is panspermia. The idea that life arrives whole and complete, that somehow asteroids hitting the earth or some initial collision that we might have had with a large body in our own solar system billions of years in the past could have actually brought life to our planet whole and complete. Science can't explain how all of a sudden, <clears throat> excuse me, there was this large burst all of a sudden of life, meaning it's kind of like there were these amino acids floating around and a bolt of lightning struck them and all of a sudden, life. It's just not that possible. I mean, for a system to have life, we're talking about something to be able to take in nutrients, process them, and expel them. It's not just an easy thing that would whim together. And so one of the ideas to answer this confusion about how life could have started is maybe that it, arro it arrived to Earth whole and complete. So another interesting uh, analogy of looking for signs of life in places where we might not expect it is Europa. And this ties into, you know, things we see here on Earth because we have in the deepest parts of the oceans, you can break down, uh, or excuse me, you can go down 25, 30 miles deep into the ocean and we find these thermal vents shown here of this little thing breaking through the ice and shining its light on the vent. They can actually break through the surface on Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter in our own solar system that very clearly has up to a 40 mile deep ocean under its surface. Now Europa is covered with ice so it's it's a big icy planet you can see it up here on the right and underneath that surface if you we were to send a probe and crack through the ice we might actually find signs of life. Other moons of Jupiter, Ganymede, Callisto are highly volcanic activity, very hot. So on this other moon, Europa, is filled with water. So we combine heat, water, we might have the elements that are needed for life. Not always required to have sunlight. Just as we've shown here on Earth, we go down to these thermal vents where there's no light whatsoever, and these vents are uh, you know, expelling sulfur and other various minerals, and we find crabs and all types of uh, insects and things that are feeding off this. It's very interesting. <clears throat> so it really starts to raise the question, uh, you know, how, how did man get to where he is? If we haven't evolved, which a lot of people would say, you know, the reason why there's, there's, there's this missing link is what it's called in the Darwinistic evolution, is they haven't been able to find anything that connects us from the Neanderthal man to us. So they say, oh, well, there's a missing link, and we're going to eventually find something that connects us to the pre-hominoid Neanderthal man. Haven't found it yet. So how did we get here? How... how how is it that we show up on Earth? And interestingly enough, when we analyze many of the structures around the world from our ancient cultures, they show a type of brilliance and a knowledge being displayed that, frankly, modern archaeologists don't attribute to ancient man. So they would say things like, oh, well, Stonehenge and the Giza pyramids or Nazca, these megalithic monuments here in Baalbek and Lebanon, uh, we don't have the technology even today to cut rocks out of the ground that are this large and carry them five miles away and perfectly stack them. If you look closely enough here on the image on the right, you can actually see a gentleman who's standing next to the wall and, and to give you an idea of just how large these stones are. 
So these are called Trilithiton stones. This is in Baalbek in Lebanon. And it's just another one of the sacred sites around the world that clearly ancient man possessed the knowledge or the technical know-how to be doing things that we didn't quite attribute them having. Mathematics, science, geometry, uh, things having to do with astronomy and alignment of the stars, which specifically I focused on the Sumerian connection and we're going we're gonna to look into tonight. So the Sumerians basically show up, as I, as I said, yeah, 6,000 BC, which is around, uh, or excuse me, that's actually incorrect. It's 4,000 BC and it's 6,000 years ago. So we're, we're talking about a culture that's around 6,000 years old. And they show up uh, right between the Tigris and Euphrates. You can look there on the map. It's labeled Mesopotamia. Excuse me. And that's basically our modern day Iraq. And that fertile strip of land has been called the cradle of civilization where our, where our, our first culture showed up. Now, we've had cavemen and, and you know, hunter-gatherer groups that have left traces of their evidence, but the Sumerian culture was the first one to leave us a complete record of a civilization, a writing, mathematics, science, agriculture, all of these things. Over 100 of the firsts needed to have a high civilization came from Sumer, and we still use many of these today. One of the interesting things they left us, left us is mathematics. Now, they had a system of mathematics called sexagesimal, which was based on 6 and 10, 60 for, for easiest uh, reference. And what they were able to do was to divide and, and show in geometry very high uh, numbers of area and distribution and very small numbers. So they were able to do very accurate measurements based on their mathematical system. And literally, this is a culture coming right out of the Stone Age that just appears in, in, uh, in southern Iraq in uh, you know, 4000 BC. So some of the items that they left us, again, having to do with the time, 12 hours in a day, 12 inches in a foot, 60 minutes in an, in, in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, uh, 12 months in a year, all of this comes from the Sumerian information of, of what we still use today. Now, interestingly enough, there is a scholar named Zachariah Sitchin. Hopefully some of you would be familiar with him. Uh, he's written a series of books called The Earth Chronicles, some of them shown here. And he has done over 50 years now of research in translating the Sumerian texts and putting it into a very large-scale understanding of what was taking place in our past. So Zachariah Sitchin is one of about 270 people in the whole world that can actually read this ancient language called cuneiform script. The Sumerians had the first written language and it was called cuneiform script. It consisted of over 400 characters. They used something called a stylus, was kind of like an oversized screwdriver, and they would twist it and turn it in the clay or sometimes uh, in inscribing it on precious stone as you see here, leaving a written language called cuneiform script. Now along with the text, they also provided many pictograms and cylinder seals which would accompany the text as a visual guide to describe what you were seeing. And, you know, as a, a, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, so they learned that very quickly. This is actually a very interesting stellar that shows uh, the 12 houses of the zodiac. Now again, there's that number 12, which we're, we're going to discuss quite thoroughly uh, in the lecture. Uh, tonight, but here they're showing, and if you look, you can actually see the the lion and the scorpion, and these are and these are basically there's a snake going around the top side of it. These are symbols from our zodiac inscribed on a precious stone from the twelve houses of the zodiac. See, the Sumerians were the first ones. Let me explain that point really quickly. A lot of people just hear, oh, astrology, it's some type of mystical stuff. Not that I'm really into astrology, but the fundamental aspects of what it means are interesting. The Sumerians basically divided the heavens into 12 parts. And they said, in each one of these sections, we'll assign a constellation, giving it a reference of some type of animal or uh, you know, like a bird or, uh, you know, many of the constellations, Leo, Aquarius, Sagittarius, are all assigned to some type of entity. So they were the first ones to divide the heavens into 12 parts and in such a way that during the time of helical rising, it's just basically when you stand out and it's just at the time when the sun is setting. So if you're watching in the direction of where the sun is rising, excuse me, where the sun is rising, 
you can see what constellation the sun is rising against. So you would say, ah, I see that the sun is rising uh, in front of the age of Aquarius, uh, excuse me, in front of the constellation for Aquarius or the constellation of Leo or Taurus. And that would let you know, ah, we are in the age of Aquarius. So that's how they came up with this idea of dividing the heavens into 12 parts and knowing during the Heleclial rising, when the sun is coming up in the morning, what age we are in based on what constellation they were seeing at that time. It's very interesting. Here's another Sumerian, uh, more of a precious stone lined with gold, electroplated with gold. And very interestingly enough, it talks about the, uh, it's basically a Sumerian king talking to his son, inscribing information having to do with their gods. And they, they, the Sumerians spoke of their gods and gave them a, t a term, which was Anunnaki. And the term Anunnaki simply in English means those who from heaven come to earth. So the Sumerians specifically write about interactions with these beings called the Anunnaki. And here again it's just a, uh, a religious stone and you see above them a symbol of the winged disc and a, and a, a crescent moon shaped object. And basically that winged disc is a symbol of these Anunnaki, their living gods. So. The reason why the Sumerian information really starts to take a twist of uh, a twist of interest is they have very accurate astronomical information. They recorded over hundreds of years observations in the sky. There were actually tablets that if who could whoever scholar, whatever scholar was able to read this information could tell you and this was very sacred information only high priests and certain scribes were given the the ability to write and read this information. Now some of these tablets for instance could tell you 50 years in advance when there was going to be a solar eclipse. So someone reading this could tell you, ah yes, in 50 years on this date the sun will rise on this time and will be eclipsed by the moon or vice versa. And so they had very accurate astronomical information that they've recorded in stone. So this is, this is a, a, a text for instance that we're looking at here that's from a culture, again, 6,000 years old. Now, you hear the term 6,000 years, you're like, well, what's the difference? 6,000, 4,000, what's the difference? If you realize that it's 2005, we're basically, you know, 2,000 years, let's say, we're basically 2,000 years removed from when the time of Christ was here, AC to B, uh, BC to AD. So 2,000 years ago. Now, if you go back another 2,000 years from that point, you're at the God of the Hebrew God, uh, Abraham. Right? So if you go back another 2,000 years from that point, you're at the Sumerian culture. 4,000 years, 4,000 BC, 6,000 years ago. So it's very interesting that, again, a culture that old is leaving us information that now, with our technology, sending probes into space, ground-based telescopes, can now confirm the ob observa observations made by the Sumerians thousands of years ago. So this brings into a very interesting question. Where did they learn this information? How do they get it? Now in colleges and institutions today, they just teach people, ah, the Sumerians were the first culture on earth. They invented mathematics and writing, but they don't tell you specifically the knowledge they had or what they were writing about. And a lot of that had to do with their interaction with their living gods, which we simply, the, the saying has now been titled through the work of Eric Von Daniken and Zachary Sitchin and a few others, ancient astronauts. Ancient man wasn't visited by gods, but by beings from another planet, ancient astronauts, just like we will probably do in our future, is venture out into space and find other cultures and impart them with technology, just as it's happened to us. So there's many references that we look at for in the English version of the Bible that describe interaction with spiritual beings that were actually material, real you know, beings that departed knowledge to man. And so the question is, well, where is heaven exactly? It's just every reference that we have in the New King James English Version, the, the word heaven actually just means sky, the heavens. It doesn't mean some mythical place that's in the white fluffy clouds with a big pearly gate opening. No, this is a mistranslation. It's actually just meaning the skies. So a very interesting thing is, is what, do we, what do we really know about uh angels and stuff like that. And so my quest, again, was in looking at the Sumerian information, they have paralleled many of the biblical tales from the Noah's Ark, the Adam and Eve. Many of these tales are found in a Sumerian version. 
in stone, unchanged, telling the exact same story as the English version, but it's in stone, thousands of years older. So some of the things that they also show, again, were the interaction with their living gods, the Anunnaki. Just like we see in the Bible, interaction with angels. Look at these stellars. For instance, this one is a depiction in Iraq shown a Sumerian king greeting an Anunnaki coming down on some type of flying craft, having the ability coming from heaven to earth, a physical thing. So these depictions, here's a pullback of, uh, of that same type of a shot. These type of pictures are describing a time when ancient man was seeing things that we today just for whatever reasons aren't seeing. But they didn't have the ability, the technical understanding that we do. So ancient man living in clay huts and using stone tools didn't understand technology and space travel. So advanced beings and coming and visiting us and departing us this knowledge are just looked at as gods, but not today. With our understanding of technology, we start to view things differently. So many of these artifacts that show us ancient man depicting how their gods came to visit, they didn't understand to say, oh, it was a spacecraft. Anything in the, in the sky flying around was a living being, a bird. You know, so they depicted their gods with wings, saying they had the power of flight. This is a, a, a very interesting artifact that shows one of the Sumerian gods her name was Ishtar, or also known as Inanna. And she had the powers to basically roam the skies of Earth. And there are tales that many men found her attractive, but did not want to go with her because they found out that all the men that ended up going with her would sleep with this, this god, Inanna, and then kill her. And then, uh, she, excuse me, she would kill them. So there's actually a Sumerian tale that describes how one of the kings was seduced by her, but said, no, no, <laughs> thank you anyways, but I'd like to continue living. But again, if you look at the, the accuracy of their, and their, you know, their beauty of their ar ar architecture and their archaeology of the artifacts, and it's just amazing that uh, we show these things to scholars today, and they're like, you know, it's amazing that they were able to create such intricate uh, wall reliefs and artifacts that still exist today. So this is a wall relief of a typical Anunnaki that we have seen left throughout the region describing these beings, the ones that from heaven come to earth. And Zachariah Sitchin has done significant research explaining the role of what these beings did here on earth. Some of them were uh, kings and, and, and assisted in you know building projects. Some of them were in charge of spaceports like this one that we see here. This is a gentleman that was in charge of a spaceport. That's what he has, the unique headdress looking more like a bird. But very interesting, again, ancient symbology. Ancient man didn't understand what they were seeing, so they depict him with wings. Well, interestingly enough, the first manned mission we had to the moon, we depicted Apollo 11 as Houston, the eagle has landed. Now, 6,000 years from now, I seriously doubt that our, uh, our not ancestors, but the people that will come after us, will we'll not look and see, ah, the symbology they were showing. What were they doing? Were they putting birds on the moon? No. They'll understand that we were saying symbolically they had the power of flight. So it's just a very interesting thing that when we look at the artifacts left to us by these cultures and start to realize, yes, they were witnessing things happening in their time when beings visiting them had the power of flight. But they didn't understand technology, and so they just assumed that they were their gods. And for all rights and purposes, as Zachariah Sitchin's research has shown us, that missing link came from the Anunnaki. So in a sense, they are our gods, but gods with a small g, basically just using some of their own genetic material and the pre-hominoid man that existed here naturally to create us in their image and after their likeness, just like the Bible says. So very interestingly, uh, we have many artifacts from this culture. And again, I mentioned earlier, one of the forms of this was a cylinder seal. This little round stone object you see was basically another thing that baffled scholars. Sumerians were able to reverse carve these pictures so that you could roll out over wet clay the cylinder seal and get a positive imprint. It's kind of like a modern day printing press so they could easily disseminate these clay tablets through the, through the city. Here's another depiction of their, uh, their gods, the Anunnaki. Again, having the power of flight, they depicted them with wings. You can look at the aesthetics and 
uh, some of the things. If you look right where they're where the wings crest over his shoulder, you can see he's got some type of knives or some type of tools tucked into his pouch. You can see he's holding some type of an object, holding some type of a purse around his wrist. Looks like to either be a decorative band or could possibly be even a watch. I mean, again, the Sumerians depicting a wrist, some type of thing around the wrist, they're not going to understand what the device was for. They're just depicting what it was. But we see it clearly displayed. Again, the wrist, all of them having this some type of an object. Now, whether, again, that was a decorative gear or some type of technology, when we look at the, the references the ancients are giving us, wings, uh, headdress, look at their demeanor, they're, they're, they're well-groomed. So it's, it's just very interesting that they're depicting their living gods as being amongst them and actually saying, wow, you know, the, they had the power to do these things, and the only way we can describe these pictorially is to give references of the things we see in nature. So another uh, beautiful wall relief that just shows the, the detail in their design of creating you know, uh, wall reliefs, the color, the intricacy of what they're showing. It's just amazing. Another cylinder seal reference. This is actually Inanna, as I showed a, 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 an artifact a few slides back. This is just a cylinder seal that when rolled out shows the positive imprint. Very interesting. And again, you know, uh, not being a Sumerian linguist, Zachariah Sitchin's work has been very crucial in understanding some of these key pieces for putting it into a larger context, what was going on. Many archaeologists and scholars today, linguists, will just translate this part of the information, this one stellar, this one artifact. Zachariah Sitchin was one of the very few to put all of the information into a context and give it an overall view and understanding for what it all means. Another depiction, one of my favorites, very clear, concise showing a humanoid Anunnaki somehow having the power of flight and how else to depict it with wings. So where is heaven? This is where the information starts to focus specifically on where did the Anunnaki come from? They weren't just floating down from the sky. Very specifically, the Sumerians said the Anunnaki came from another planet within our solar system and they called this planet Nibiru. Nibiru stood for planet of the crossing. So they actually gave a, a visual depiction of Nibiru as a cross, a glowing cross in the sky. Now there are many depictions from the Sumerian uh, artifacts. Here's a cylinder seal, two of them. If you look closely enough on the larger far right hand bottom one, you see a seated king and above him to the left is a cross in the sky. That was a symbol of Nibiru. Another reference. Basically here on the top left, this was during daylight, daylight hours, some farmers plowing, again the Sumerians were the first ones to have a plow, agriculture, they're noticing in awe during daylight a glowing cross in the sky. So this symbol of Nibiru actually transcribed into the Egyptian culture and later Assyrian cultures, uh, and that's why we see in wall reliefs in Iraq and Iran still to this day, this winged disc, this depiction of the winged disc, even in Egyptian cultures, the sun god Ra is a winged disc. This all comes from the Sumerian information of the Anunnaki. So again, more information that they had was very extensive astronomical information where they depicted all of the planets that we have in our solar system. However, they depicted an additional planet, this Nibiru. So, very interesting, they showed the distance between the planets and gave symbols for the planets. Here, what we're seeing in this artifact, I know it's kind of jarbled, there's a lot of stuff going on, but if you look, you can see the winged disc, you can see it clearly on the left and somewhat on the right, and next to it are seven dots, which actually represent the seven dots of Earth. Now you'd say, seven dots of Earth, what's, what's that mean? Well, interestingly enough, the Sumerians counted our solar system as having 12 members, and they counted the solar system from coming outside the solar system in. So they didn't say we were on the third rock from the sun, like that cool hip phrase used in the TV show. They counted from coming outside of our solar system in. Now if you look at the diagram here, coming from outside in, Nibiru, and then you'd have Pluto, Neptune, uh, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Earth, the seventh planet. Now, they counted Nibiru as the twelfth planet because they counted the nine planets we know of, our sun making ten, 
our moon making 11 and Nibiru the 12th. So just again showing uh, coming from outside of our solar system in they gave us the label of being you're on the seventh planet. Now again the sacred number seven, seven days in a week, seven days of creation, the seven tablets of creation the Sumerians actually have seven tablets that tell the creation story. Not seven days and it was all done, the English version. No, they have a very detailed, it's called the Enuma Elish. And on seven of the tablets, it very specifically explains how our solar system came about, how our planets formed, and very specifically how life formed on Earth. So the Sumerians bequeathed the, the knowledge to us that we are actually on the seventh planet. Here's another Sumerian artifact. Not really sure what the reference to it other than what it's showing. I thought it was interesting. This is a press that they would press in, and it shows the cross of Nibiru with its crescent moon, the seven dots of Earth, and our crescent moon. Very interesting. And just real quickly, I'll pause to say you'll notice that there are some buttons under the list of people here that say speaker frame or your frame. If at any time you'd like to go back and look at some of the frames I've discussed as I'm continuing on. You can do that if you want to take a moment and look at something, go back on your own and look at it, you can do that. And then just hit sync to come up back to where we are. Okay, so another uh, artifact again. These artifacts that I'm showing you are all stored in the British Museum uh, and are on display for everyone to see. Uh, and clearly here, this, this uh, cylinder seal when rolled out again shows a reference to the winged disc of Nibiru and the seven dots of Earth. So some more interesting aspects of the knowledge is that they showed in uh, one of the depictions a very clear depiction of our solar system. Now this one has become quite a famous tablet because here it is just very simply it's what's happening here is, is there's an Anunnaki granting man the plow, modern agriculture. But as a backdrop to the cylinder seal we see our complete solar system with the sun correctly placed in the center. Now, since the time of Copernicus and Galileo, man thought that Earth was the center of the universe. And through the time and advances in telescope and astronomy, we realized, ah, we actually orbit the sun. Well, the Sumerians knew that thousands of years ago and, and left it depicted in stone, unchanged, as their reference showing that they knew. So here is a very interesting artifact uh, that's been translated by Zachariah Sitchin. Now, many of the ancient, many of the scholars would say that the ancient man wasn't familiar with the shape of an ellipse, a, a wheel, or a circle. Well, here you go. Here's a stone tablet they were using an ellipse for writing. This one specific area of the writing, you can see it was a badly damaged tablet, but this one specific area, when enlarged, as explained and translated by Zachariah Sitchin, tells us something very interesting. Here we have a tablet telling of how the Anunnaki, what route they took to get from Nibiru, the vicinity of the solar system of where Nibiru was, to us. And you can see the translation clearly from, from Zachariah Sitchin explains, along the side it says rocket, rocket, mountain, mountain, pile up, high, high. Uh, we have the names of the planets, Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, the planets that you have to go by. You see the mountainous depiction of Nibiru. It's a big triangle there, a mountainous depiction. Nibiru, a mountainous planet. And look at this. You look, you can see there's seven dots. The route from Nibiru to Earth, God Enlil went by the planets. And guess what? If you count how many planets there are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh planet. So it's a very interesting thing. Again, when we start to look at this information by a, an ancient culture, giving us very technical information that we can now understand with our understanding of science and technology. So another interesting aspect of the, of the story is where the Sumerians describe how this planet that the, the Anunnaki come from, Nibiru, has a very interesting tale of basically creating our Earth and the asteroid belt, that the whole explanation for how our solar system came to be is explained by the Sumerians and the interaction of what they called an intruder planet. They said that basically Nibiru was a rogue planet. Now they wrote this down as translated, or excuse me, as transcribed to them, bequeathed to them by the Anunnaki. They said that this, this Nibiru, what we now call a planet X under modern terms to try and identify this ancient planet, planet X, Nibiru, 
It came in, we're talking billions of years ago when this happened, in the formation of our solar system, 4.7 billion years ago, whatever, long time ago. Planet X gets pulled in by the gravita gravitational pull of our outer planets and comes onto a path where it slams into our Earth. Now, it doesn't actually hit our Earth, but the main, the main moon of Nibiru, labeled North Wind, you can see it sweeping, arcing under planet X, collided with our planet in such a way that it literally split our planet in half and strewed off the rest of the debris to become the asteroid belt. Nibiru went on to have a long, very long, 3,600 year orbit around our sun. You can see all the other planets are going you know, uh, around in more of a circular orbit, but Nibiru has a huge elliptical orbit that takes it 3,600 years to orbit once around our sun. So it's a very interesting tale that they basically said that now when we look at where the asteroid belt is, that's where Nibiru comes in through its, its paths. So every 3,600 years, Nibiru loops around through the inner part of our solar system, passing between Mars and Jupiter. Now here's a little interesting tidbit from the ufology side. Whether it's true or not, there's a very famous secret government project called Majestic 12, MJ-12. Now MJ-12 was a council of 12 people that looked into the whole alien abduction UFO phenomenon in the US government. But very interestingly enough, MJ-12 could also might have stand for Mars, Jupiter, 12th planet. What that means specifically, or if there's any connection, don't know, but I found that interesting. And if you look at the diagram here, there's two points I want to show. If you look between the, the distance between Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is, there's clearly enough planet, there's clearly enough space, based on the orbit disbursement of the other planets, for a planet to easily pass through that space. And what I've done is showed a, 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 just a very simple mathematical calculation that doing a rough idea of when this initial collision took place, the initial formation of our solar system, roughly 4.7 billion years ago, if Nibiru is passing through the inner solar system every 3,600 years, a simple mathematical calculation shows 4.7 billion years, the time of its initial pass, divided by its how long it takes to do it, we're looking at over a million times that Nibiru has passed through the inner solar system. So it might not always affect Earth. Now we know that it has affected Earth because of what the Sumerians have told us. We've had rumors on the internet that say, ah, oh, this planet is coming back and it's going to cause what the Sumerians describe, a great flood, the Noah's Ark scenario. I don't agree with this information, as everyone has now seen for themselves, 2003 came and, and went. So a lot of people have heard misinformation about this topic, but what I've tried to show is let's stick to the facts. There's enough evidence to show this is legit without blowing it out of proportion. Now here's one of the tablets actually showed, excuse me, stored in the British Museum that explains this tale of how Nibiru came in, whacked our inner planet, created the asteroid belt, as the Bible calls it, the hammered out bracelet. So we have the artifacts to very specifically tell us this tale of how our solar system formed and more specifically Earth. Very interestingly enough, another point to back this up is the Pangea factor. Now if Earth was whacked and made into just a half a planet, a half a chunk, if it was, right as we saw here, spewed off to just make half a, half a planet, well, Pangea, we know that from, from our history, at one point, it was all just one connected landmass, a big lump of land. So the other half was just water, an open basin. That, now over time, we've had this through continental drift, you know, the, 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 the way the, the, like a skin of an apple, the continents have been drifting, plate tectonics show us, at one time, these were all connected. So this again confirms the idea that it was just one big lump of land. Now the Sumerians, again, have a very interesting parallel to the biblical tales. One of those, renowned, is the flood tablet. There was a, a, a British archaeologist in the early 1900s that was excavating, doing excavations in Iraq, and all of a sudden he finds this tablet that he can't believe what it says. He has to throw his arms up and run out of the room screaming, I can't believe what I found. Basically it's a, a tale, the exact same word-for-word -word description of a a man being chosen by a god to build a craft. But it's not Noah, 
It's Uten Pesin. <laughs> Uten Pesin. And it's basically, you can see his name listed here, it's basically a Sumerian man who's chosen by an Anunnaki and given the knowledge to say, listen, you need to build this ship, take all the surrounding animals and your family with you, because there's going to be a great flood. When our planet passes by, it's going to crack off a big old chunk of ice in Antarctica, and the water level is going to raise 300 feet. And that's what happened. At least that's how the Sumerians describe it. And it's kind of like the chicken or the egg syndrome. What came first? And here we have a Noah's Ark tale told in its original Sumerian stone version, unchanged. Just like here, a depiction showing the Sumerians worshipping an Anunnaki. Now, the giants upon the earth, as the Bible say. Here we have a Sumerian, uh, excuse me, let me go back one. A Sumerian stellar, a wall relief, showing that the Anunnaki were actually physically bigger beings than us. Now, how tall they were, how, how much larger, I don't know. They are always depicted as being aesthetically very muscular, fit, uh, good genetics, <laughs> and larger than us. So some more interesting information that's come out throughout time is, I found this to be very interesting. This was held by a, a, a Turkish admiral found in 1513. It's the Paris Reis map. Now what we're seeing here is a time when, when the continents were actually still connected. You can see North and South America uh, still connected. You can see the boats there, but the land masses are actually still connected in a way where this geography was inscribed and shown by ancient man and recorded and left to us in ways that still boggle uh, modern science as to how they could have known this information. They were able to show the topography of Antarctica under the ice sheet, meaning today we have ground penetrating radar and satellites that even though there's two miles thick ice covering Antarctica, we can see what the actual topography of the land is using this penetrating radar. Well, gee, here we have from 1513 a, a map clearly showing the accurate topography of Antarctica without the use of this radar penetrating technology. So obviously someone had to depart this knowledge to them. Who could that have been? Hmm. Okay, so again, we look towards more of the modern, modern search for this planet. Now, many people, again, have been caught up with the rumor that this planet is coming back to kill us. No. What if this planet holds our ancient ancestors? What if there are beings living on this planet and we can still find it? And say, wow, there are beings connected to us, you know, not on Earth. Heavy topic. So, it's not the doom and gloom aspect. It's the scientific proof to confirm what the Bible has been telling us all along. Have, the, have ancient man been visited by these, you know, gods, as they called it, but they're basically a part of us, our own flesh and blood. Now, will we ever meet them again? Are they still here? Why don't we see them now? Many deep areas of ufology that go into the government, government cover-up, some of those we can touch on. The modern search for a Planet X basically started in the, in the early 80s where we started to see that we, we, when we sent astronomical satellites into space to do infrared observations based on heat signatures, we started to see all these new planets and things that we weren't able to see before just by visual light, uh, visible light. So when they started to do mathematical calculations based on the observations on the outer planets, they started to notice wobbles in the outer planets, something called a perturbation. The planets are being pulled in a certain direction that leads them to believe there's some other large body out there causing this influential pull, but they don't know what it is. So, an unknown planet, X, but symbolically, if it's beyond Pluto, it would be number 10, Roman numeral 10, X, so planet X. So the search begins where this gentleman on the left here was the lead uh, Naval Observatory astronomer, Dr. Robert Harrington, and had calculated based on the perturbations of the outer planets that there's some large body out there that we still haven't seen. Zachariah Sitchin on the right came and showed his model of the ancient Nibiru and said, let's, let's collaborate on our information. Let's, let's take the modern understanding of what you're looking for and see if it collaborates and coincides with Nibiru, the ancient understanding for this planet. Guess what? It did. So Dr. Robert Harrington's research became a very focal point in the ancient Nibiru search 
with a label of the modern idea of looking for a planet beyond Pluto, a planet X. Now, there's been all kinds of little things to spear up recently. A tenth planet found this, that, Sedna, Quoar, Xena. But the point is, Nibiru, as described by the Sumerians in their visual descriptions and in their verbal, is a very large planet, four to eight times the size of Earth. Not a little hunk of ice the size of Pluto. So if it's coming, we're going to see it. Dr. Robert Harrington left his astronomical plates in the Harvard journals, which are still online. You can go to the Harvard abstracts from Harvard's website. I have, have them stored on XFAX, where it shows the shots they took in the southern areas of the sky where they thought this planet would be, where we should do mathematical calculations to see further perturbations, use infrared astronomical uh, satellites to further image and see if it's out there. So modern science wasn't too happy to accept the idea of a rogue planet, a planet having an egg-shaped elliptical orbit. They weren't sure it was possible. Very interestingly enough, as soon as we launched Hubble, we started seeing them. This is another star, not our sun. And interestingly enough, you can see at the far bottom tail, it has a little planet that's orbiting this star in a very long elliptical, like egg-shaped orbit, confirming the idea that it is possible for a planet to have a very looped elliptical orbit around a star. And interestingly enough, our satellite showed from the infrared astronomical satellite, uh, there are many bodies floating around out there. Now, our task and astronomy's task has been to label all these planets and see if any of them actually are part of our solar system or have an orbit that might make them somehow a part of our solar system. There's been a whole slew of these satellites put into space looking for possible uh, brown dwarfs, failed stars. Uh, one thing that Hubble was able to find when it started doing observations was the fact that many of the solar system imaged, many of the solar systems imaged out there are binary having two suns. So they theorized that our solar system, in fact, is binary as well. That we might have another sun beyond, well beyond Pluto, billions of years out there, deep in the Oort cloud is what it's called, but it's a failed sun. It's, it's, it's gone dark. So we could have large deposits of comets, debris, another huge planet like Nibiru, that also gets looped around that dark sun and takes a long time to come back through for it to pass around our active sun now, to get thrown back towards the dark sun. So there's a lot of evidence to show that there is something out there affecting the outer planets. Throughout the last uh, decade, modern science has been recording there's something revolving around our sun that's causing an effect on the planets. And if we look at our own solar system, why is Uranus tilted on its side? Uh, why does uh, Neptune and Pluto, could they have possibly been detached moons of Saturn? All of these answers are, de are, are put into play and described with, with the, the resolution of saying there was once a huge planet that passed through and perturbated the planets and caused them to be where they are now, and we still see the effects of that planet. So where is that planet today? The search continues. Interestingly enough, we just launched uh, a couple years ago a new satellite called CERTIF. And this is one of the latest ones we have out there to detect if it's possible to see a very large extrasolar planet. Now I met with the lead scientist, a Dr. Michelle Fowler at the Jet Propulsion Laboratories and asked her point blank, will this telescope be able to find an ancient planet X, a planet four to eight times the size of Earth? And do you think it's possible that there could be something like that out there? We just haven't seen it yet. She said, yes, I do believe it's possible, but CERTIF has to be tuned into very specific points of the sky. It can't just be turned on and be like, hey, look, there it is. It'd have to look in a very specific spot, and then if it were to see it, if it was there, yes, this would have the technology to, to, be, able, to, be, uh, to be able to put this into our visual range of light to see it. Uh, some of the images taken by CERTIF, you can see here, to give you an idea of what I mean, you see this is one of the CERTIF images taken, and the normal visible light shown at the top is just a white spiral that we'd be used to, but when they use the advanced technology, and the thermal imaging that this telescope provides, you can see the various other degrees of, of light penetrating radar that they're able to abstract. And when we see the, the white versus that colored, look at all those little bright red planets that they couldn't even see before. Look at all of them. Those are all suns. All those little red glowing dots are suns. You know, so 
the amount of data that we're getting from Certif is just amazing in detail. Now, will Planet X be found soon? There's been a whole slew of these planetoids beyond Pluto that have been found. Coar, Sedna, Xena just recently. And the, the main factor to get caught up on is these are small. They're all the size of Pluto. The Nibiru that we're talking about is four to eight times the size of Earth. Very large object. No way we're going to miss it with ground-based or space-based telescopes. So here we have the Keck Inferometer, another famous one in, in Hawaii, where it's able to use two very fine focused beams of energy and pull in a more, a more digital, uh, or uh, excuse me, a more detailed digital image uh, of what they're looking at. Very powerful ground-based uh, telescope. Uh, and one of the things that we're out there looking for, again, are these brown drawers. So that, so that you understand what it is, we're talking about like large gas giants. When the sun eventually, like ours, will blow up one day, it will then shrink down and implode into a gas giant. Jupiter, for instance, is about the size you can see in relation to these other, uh, uh, like our sun and the brown dwarfs. The failed stars that we're talking about, a brown dwarf, is a very large object. So some of the things that, again, I'm going to kind of wrap it up towards the angle of saying, some of the things that we do have to pay attention towards is, is there a threat from space? And very clearly, when we start to analyze the astronomical information, even from the Sumerian culture, which is thousands of years old, they tell us there was a time when a great calamity took place. A large object, you know, the, the Nibiru passing by, could have other debris following it. You know, comets, asteroids, other debris, and this stuff is subject to whacking us. Now, not even with Nibiru into play, NASA, through Deep Impact, Armageddon, various releases of like 2028, there's a huge asteroid that could hit us. This is something we have to be aware of. Is there possibly a threat in space coming from natural objects that we at least need to be aware of? And very clearly, when we look at things that have happened, like the impact of, impact of uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9, and this comet broke up into nine parts and impacted Jupiter, you can actually see the scar marks uh, left from these impacts. Now those dark spots could fit four to eight times, or four to eight Earths in just one of those little dark spots. Four to eight Earths, that's about the size of Nibiru actually. Look how large of a scar that is on Jupiter though. You know, so, you know, to think that we're not in any danger of space threat uh, of, uh, you know, asteroid or comet, it's definitely something that we need to be aware of because from the extinction of the dinosaurs to all the things that show, we've been whacked throughout history many times. So my own personal belief having to do with ufology and our level of technology that they don't really share with us, our militar militarization of space has allowed us, I believe, the fortitude to not have to worry about that stuff to the largest degree. I think we have the weapons, the Star Wars program, big hunking asteroids coming towards us, we're going to blow that sucker out of the sky. That's my personal belief. But Again, we do need to keep the radar of threatening objects coming from space. Now, one of the things to collaborate this idea that we might have a binary sun, uh, you know, a twin sun, a failed star, is the nemesis theory. There's been extensive research to show that very possibly there's this large Oort cloud and we have another sun at the, at the far reaches of this cloud that sends a lot of debris towards the inner solar system on a cyclic event. And we can look, uh, we can look into the, you know, the solar system now and, and into the, the galaxy, if you will, using these telescopes and start to see all those dots, all those glowing dots, those are all suns. All the bright objects are bases, basically places of activity that we still have yet to kind of zero in on and look for. Interestingly enough, this, this uh, nemesis theory describes the idea that there's a, a very large object that orbit, orbits, you know, this failed sun at the far reaches of our solar system. There's this other object orbiting around our sun, and that possibly, when it does its own orbit around that sun, sends debris towards the inner part of our solar system. And this, as Dr. Uh, Mueller here explained, uh, is that it's possible that on an extinction level event happening on millions of years, not 3,600 years like Nibiru's over orbit, but on a scale of millions of years, there could be a cyclic event 
where large chunks of debris are sent towards the inner part of our solar system. And he theorized this is what possibly took out the dinosaurs, is that there was this large asteroid that was pushed with a bunch of other debris towards the inner part of our solar system, and it was at a time when there was a lot of other planets being uh, hit, bombarded by debris, and we were subject to that whacking. So there are many asteroids on the plate now where our near Earth asteroid uh, detection program is publicly letting us know, hey, look, there are asteroids out there that we're tracking that are coming really close. Now, what they define as close, an astronomical unit, is the distance from here to the sun. And what we have found is that there has been several asteroids that pass relatively close to us. Relatively close would be anything from the distance from Earth to the moon, that distance, that little window, anything passing between the moon and our Earth is like hugely close. <laughs> so they have sighted a couple of these asteroids that are very, very close to Earth and are kind of just letting us be aware of them. They go out and send probes to image them and uh, you know get more research so that we can understand what affects their orbit and is it possible that this orbit be, could be retrograded into a path that could come and whack us. So the kind of the last angle I want to wrap it up with is you know the other interesting angle that the Sumerians left of, left us is depictions of the, the Anunnaki helpers. Uh, they called these beings helpers of the Ejiji and they very clearly depicted them as these these humanoid figurines that modern day I, uh, aliens have a resemblance to. These, these bulbous head, large eyed beings that seem to be the helpers of the Anunnaki. Sumerians described that the Anunnaki used these beings to fly their craft, to help with medical experiments. So I theorize, my own hypothesis, very possible, if the Anunnaki actually did create us in their image and after their likeness, and they're orbiting their own Nibiru and this advanced race, it's very possible they could have also made another genetic engineered race to kind of oversee us and kind of keep tabs on their, their grand experiment. Because very interestingly enough, we have modern depictions of these gray aliens all looking the same, like they could be types of a clone. And they do medical experiments on us and checkups and sexual things having to do with what our physiology is doing, you know what I mean? And they're combining with their own race and stuff like that we hear. But I just theorize, what if it's possible that there's this other grand experiment that they're just kind of relaying the information and the data they collect from us on our physiology and our makeup back to the Anunnaki, relaying the grand experiment to them. So I guess what I would like to say is just that I don't think we've ever been alone. And when we start to analyze the texts from these ancient cultures, it's very clear that ancient man had interaction with beings from the heavens all around the world. We have from almost every culture, the Hopi Indians in North, North America, uh, the Incas, the Aztecs, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, all of them, even going back to the Veda texts of the ancient Hindus in India, describe a time when man had interaction with their living gods. So I just simply say that these beings probably never have left. And that for whatever reason, we are now being slowly desensitized to this information. Uh, if there is a galactic federation of planets, or uh, like we see in Star Wars or Star Trek, a conglomerate race of beings that make these decisions, we're on quarantine right now. Earth is on quarantine. That's why I don't think we're seeing a lot of the activity as far as outright, hello, we're here. Because Earth isn't quite ready yet. We're still blowing up the planet, utilizing, or excuse me, uh, expelling natural resources, killing each other, what are we going to do with more technology at this point? So I think we're just slowly being nudged to make these changes for ourselves, for ourselves, and hopefully in our lifetime we will actually get to see, as the ancients did, a time when man lived amongst his living gods. So uh, I thank everyone for coming to the virtual lecture today. Uh, we, we whipped through those slides at a good pace. I'll take a few minutes if anyone would like to type a couple of questions. And uh, that's okay, Emma. That's okay. You're allowed to be late. Uh, if anyone has a couple of questions, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer those now. So uh, shoot them at me. We had a nice little intimate group today, it looks like. And again, uh, this, this lecture will be posted tomorrow as an archived copy.
that you will be able to download and watch uh, at your own leisure. So I'll just wait a minute, see if anyone's typing up a long question here or anything. Okay, looks like we're good. I'm going to go ahead and end the, end the lecture today then. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, look forward to uh, uh, the next lecture next month. is going to be uh, focusing on some of the structures on Mars. And I'll have that date posted soon.